Lola Perrin, composer, pianist, and publisher, presents her piano suites created between 1992 and 2009 during seven concerts in a series hosted by Marks and Pianos in this wonderful building. Lola's music has drawn comparisons with the music of Ravel, Debussy, Sati, Keith Jarrett, Philip Glass, Steve Reich, and Michael Minor. Each suite was motivated by triggers ranging from visual art to science and stories. Tonight's speaker, if I can just briefly introduce him, John Bryson is a photographer, co-founder of Beecher Gallery and creative director and design consultancy at Phoebus Association, Associates in London. So I'd like to welcome John Bryson. I first met Lola in the summer of 2007. We had been asked to curate an art exhibition for the Earl's Court Festival, and Lola responded to our call for submissions. We hadn't been expecting musicians to apply, and it was then that she described how her work took direct inspiration from the visual arts. We listened, and we were moved. This made perfect sense. In fact, it made perfect sense to all our senses. I think we can all see music and hear paintings from time to time, don't you? Um, a few months later, Lola asked if I'd be interested in working on a film for one of her pieces entitled Light Trails. The resulting piece is a still frame animation of a walking journey along the edge of the Thames from Battersea to London Bridge over the course of one day. We had intended to show the film this evening, but unfortunately lighting conditions in the church make any large scale projections impossible this time of year. Perhaps later in the year it's a bit darker. Lola will be performing two pieces this evening. The first is Sweet One, early one Sunday morning, after Edward Hopper's early Sunday morning, which, as Lola puts it, is triggered by the lives and dreams of people who are out of sight, yet somehow present in Hopper's painting of a quiet row of houses at dawn. Early Sunday morning is considered one of Hopper's most evocative pieces and has been referred to as a minimalist symphony. It was painted in 1930 at a point when the confidence of the 20s had given way to the uncertainty of the 30s. If you weren't familiar with the work, imagine a row of houses in 7th Avenue in New York. It was originally called 7th Avenue Shops. The second story windows are identical in size, but every one somehow reflects each tenant's individuality. One critic described these as miniature Rothko's. He was equally admired for his stark abstraction painfully surfaces in studiously constructed minimal compositions. Hopper once said, all I, really want, all I really want to do is paint light falling on a white wall. It's funny Lola refers to the people who are out of sight in Hopper's painting. He had originally painted a figure in one of the windows, but later painted it out. The lives and dreams of people imagined in this, on this stage are possible because, Hopper, because of Hopper's ability to suggest but never describe a narrative. His aim was to be more general, less specific. He was creating something timeless, something universal, a setting for the theater that had just or was about to take place. He took certain liberties to achieve that end. You can see the soft shines, but they're purposely illegible. The long shadows across the sidewalk bring mood and atmosphere, but are impossible. As this, as this is in North-South Avenue. Hopper was hailed as a realist who invented new ways of picturing the American experience. He was a daunting man at six feet, seven inches tall, who was famous for his monumental silences. Silences that were never empty, though, just like the spaces in his pictures. Lola's second performance this evening will be Suite Two, Nine Images for Piano, after Ansel Adams composed from memories of the atmospheres in Ansel Adams' photographs and subsequent stories imagined in the style of his photography. Yes, another iconic American realist. Where Hopper was a man of few words, Adams was extremely vocal, lobbying Congress for stricter laws regarding the environment in the wilderness and formulating policy for the Sierra Club. It was claimed he wrote more letters to the editor than any sane person. Adams rejected pictorialism for a more realistic approach, which relied heavily on sharp focus, heightened contrast, precise exposure, and dark room craftsmanship. It was during the 30s that Adams produced some of his most important work, as well as the manifesto for pure photography, 
which was defined as possessing no qualities of technique, composition, or idea, simple and pure. This sensibility to the specificity of light was the motive that forced Adams to develop his legendary photographic technique. Ansel Adams had begun his career as a trained classical pianist. He describes music as making him see things more intensely. One day he had to decide between music and photography. He has said he could hear music in a photograph, not sentimentally, but structurally. He described the negative, he once said, the negative is like the composer's score and the print is like a performance. Family members told him that the camera could never express the human soul. His, his response, I don't think the camera can, but perhaps the photographer could. Now, go to her.